Hallelujah. Glory to your most holy, precious, and righteous name. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Even for those, God, that are coming on the Bible study, Lord, touch them right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Remove everything that will try to distract tonight, God. Remove everything that is hindering them from entering into the Bible study, Lord. And Father, I give you glory. I give you honor. Hallelujah, God. And I got out of the ocean there. I give you praise. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Welcome, 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 everyone, to another Words of Wisdom Bible Study. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining in. That you thought is not robbery. Hallelujah. Even though we may go to different physical buildings, which we call the church, but how many know that we are the true church? Our body, the body that God created, hallelujah, that we are living in, our spirit man is living in, we are the true church. If you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you repented of your sins and received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are the church of the living God, hallelujah. So as we always do, hallelujah, I encourage you to take out your Bible, whether it's your paper Bible, Hallelujah. Whether it's your electronic device, your iPad, your iPhone, your Android device. Hallelujah. Whatever your love letter is on, I ask you to get it out. And as you're getting out your Bible, get out paper and pencil or paper and pen so that you can write down what the Spirit of the living God may say to you tonight. Because how many know that God is always speaking, but we're not always listening? Sometimes we're not tuned in to the frequency where God is. So tonight we want to tune in to the frequency of where God is. Hallelujah. Because once we learn God's word, Jesus said, when he goes back to heaven, the helper, the comforter, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit will come and he's going to bring things back to our remembrance, those things that Jesus has said. But if you don't get into God's word, if you don't fellowship with the Lord, you won't know the Holy Spirit can't bring something back to you that you've never heard of before. So I want you to get out your Bible, hallelujah. And as you have your Bible, whether it's whatever, your electronic device or your paper Bible, and if you're Reading your Bible on the computer, just lay your hands on the computer. Hallelujah. We're going to make the declaration declaration to ourselves, and we're going to make the declaration to the spiritual realm. And I'm holding up my pink iPad, and I declare that this is my Bible. This is my love letter from my daddy. Hallelujah. My daddy gave me his love letter. And he told me, you can also use this love letter as a sword. So as I hold up my Bible and I declare that this is my Bible, I have what he says I have. I can do what he says I can do. Tonight I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive and I will never be the same. Never, 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 never be the same in Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. How many know that when you come in contact with the word of God, you will never be the same way that you were before you came in contact with his word, because God's word has the ability to change you. It has the ability to deliver you. It has the ability to make you not set you, but make you totally free because anything that you set free, you have the ability to recatch that thing again. That thing may come right back to the area that it got caught before. But when you make someone free, Hallelujah. Not only are they physically free, but they're mentally and spiritually free. And they're not going to come back to the same place again where they were trapped before. And a matter of fact, those who have been made free, they're going to put up a sign. As my husband said, they're going to put up a stop sign. They're going to put up a do not enter sign. They're going to put up some type of warning to let you know, don't go that way. Because if you go that way, there is a chance that you will be trapped. Amen. So tonight we're going to go back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is, is where we are tonight. So we've been talking about Abraham. And we know that Abraham in chapter 4, we said that Abraham was justified by God because of his faith 
in God. He trusted God even before God gave him the law. Abraham trusted God to the point that he believed that God was able to call forth something that was not even in existence. So he believed that God was able to raise up a nation in him and through him, even though his body and Sarah's body was dead. So he had faith that was not based on what he could see. So that's the kind of faith that we need to have. We need to have the faith that is based on what we do not see, but what we're hoping for. Amen. So as we continue the journey on to Romans chapter five, we're going to see how Paul again, he's describes justification in a way that we all can understand. He's telling us how we are justified, those who have received Jesus as the Lord and Savior, those who have repented and received him as your Lord and Savior. He's showing us and telling us how we are justified in faith through Jesus Christ, that everything, because we're in the dispensation of grace, everything comes through grace and everything has to go through Jesus Christ. Our righteousness even has to go through Jesus because our righteousness is as filthy rags. We're also going to know, we're going to continue to discuss how Adam was disobedient, how he transgressed in the Garden of Eden. And because of his transgression, his disobedience, because he sinned against the Lord, because he was told not to do something and he went against the commandment or the mandate that he was given. And because of that, sin and death entered into the world. And we didn't have a choice because when we were born, we were automatically declared a sinner. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Amen. So I'm going to read a few verses of Romans chapter five, and I'm reading from the new King James version. Again, Romans chapter five. And I'm going to start with, I ended last week on verse uh, six. But I'm going to read verse 6, and then I'm going to read a few verses, and then I'm going to go back and expound on those verses, okay? So Romans chapter 6, the new, I mean, sorry, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, New King James Version. And it goes like this. My version reads like this. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Hallelujah. Glory to your holy name, God. So let's go back up to verse seven. Amen. It says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. For you who just joined in, we're at Romans chapter 5. I just read verse 7, and we're getting ready to expound. I'm getting ready to expound on it. So, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps or it's possible for a good man, someone would even dare or have the courage to die. Amen? So, the NIV says this, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. See, for a good man, a man who is kind, a one who shows love, is saying that this good man, that perhaps, perhaps, perhaps someone would even dare to die for this good man. Amen. We all know that many of us who are parents, we would give up our life for our children. But as we continue to read, we're going to find out that Jesus gave his life up even for those who hate him, who don't like him, even for those who blaspheme his name, who says all manner of evil against them. But in this verse, we're seeing that God is illustrating his great love by comparing his unmatched love with what man was or is willing to do what man is willing to do or what man might do for someone. But see, it is unlikely that a human 
who is not divine would die for a righteous person. Neither one of us, I'm pretty sure, would give up our life for some stranger, for some stranger, or may not even give up our life for a family member. Now, for your children, you just might, but for anybody else, we might question what our what giving up our life may entail because sometimes a person may give up a life for somebody and that person that they gave their life up may not even change their way may not even change what they're doing may continue on down the path that they're that they're going but see Christ died for the ungodly he died for the godly he died for the unrighteous he died for the righteous he died for all categories and race of people and he died for all of our sins every one of the sins that you've ever uh, committed or will ever commit, Christ died for that sin. And he knew that we would fall short, but yet they, him and the father created a plan of redemption and they executed that plan of redemption because of Adam's transgressions, because of his disobedience. Then in verse eight, it says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. So we did nothing to earn his love. But God, since God is love, he loves because that's who he is. His entire nature is love. So God demonstrated his love towards us. He says, I know that you don't love me. I know that you don't even know anything about me. He says, but I love you anyway. And one day you're going to come to understand the love that I have for you and why I sent my son to die to reconcile or redeem you back to myself. So God demonstrated his own love towards you, towards me, while we were still sinners, while we were still in our mess, while we were not even even thinking about coming to God. God died for us. He sent his son while we were living and operating in sin, while we had no thought of even coming to him. He demonstrated, God demonstrated his unmatched, unmeasurable, unearned love for us through the death of Christ. Amen. So innocent Jesus, he took on the form of human flesh and he died for us our guilt. He died for the guilty. He died for the undeserving. He died for the adulterer, the fornicator, the whoremonger, the murderer, the liar, the extortioner, whatever you put in that uh, blank, Christ died for that individual and that sin. So then in verse nine, it says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So much more than having now been justified by his blood. We've been justified. We've been made righteous. We've been made holy because of Jesus, because of his blood. And this only goes for those who have repented and received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Whenever I'm teaching, I constantly remind you because I don't want anyone to get false hope that they think that just because they're Christian, just because they go to church, just because they got a title in the church, just because they're on the choir, just because because they collect money on Sunday, that they are going to heaven and they have not even received Jesus as the Lord and Savior. They have not even repented. So I want to make sure that everybody is clear. If you have not re repented and received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, these verses does not apply to you. It only applies to you after you've repented and you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So much more than verse 9 says, having now been justified by his blood. By whose blood? blood? By the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross. Then it says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So Jesus died for you and me while we lived and operated in sin. He showed his love to you. He showed his love to me. And now, once you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have been adopted by God. You've been placed in his family. You've been justified. You've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. Once we repent and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we get a certificate of, of adoption. Our name has been written in the land's book of life, and now we have access to heaven. And not only do we have access to heaven, but we have access to the throne of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So Jesus' blood, the blood that he shed, we shall be saved through 
Christ Jesus, through his work on this earth, through what he has done, already done thousands of years ago, we shall be saved through Jesus Christ. What are we being saved from? We're being saved from evil, danger, and destruction. We're being saved from God's wrath. And it is a guarantee. God has guaranteed. He's given us his promise, his assurance. He said, he has, his promise will never expire. His promise will never be void. So when God said that we shall be saved from his wrath, this present wrath and the wrath that is to come, we are saved. Those of us who have repented and received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Hold on there. Hold on, hold on, hold on to the end. The same shall be saved. Those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. We're going to be saved. You hold on to the end. You're going to be saved from God's wrath because it is a guarantee that we are protected. We have a seal that you cannot see, but we have a spiritual seal that the enemy cannot touch our soul. We have a spiritual seal. Those who have are saved uh, by grace through faith, we have a spiritual seal in which the enemy cannot touch and God's wrath will not come upon us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just like he told, told the children of Israel to put the blood over your doorpost. And when the death angel comes through and he sees that he knows that you've been sealed, he knows that, that that is a sign that he is not to come into that particular dwelling place. Anyone in there is safe because of the sign that is on the door. So we have a sign on us that says, do not touch. We belong to the most high God. So God's wrath uh, must come upon the soul that sins. So, <clears throat> excuse me, anybody who has not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if they're, when their spirit leaves their body, their earthly body, if they have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, if they haven't repented and received him as their Lord and Savior, the wrath of God must come upon them. Punishment and judgment must come upon them because that is the way it is written. It is written that Wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So God has given us an escape route by giving us Jesus, by trying to reconcile us. And reason why I say trying is because there are some who will not receive that branch, olive branch, that uh, invitation to be reconciled to God. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So if someone exits or leaves this earth, and they have not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, have not repented, then they're going to have to pay the penalty for the sin that they've committed in their body. And the penalty is eternal damnation, eternal death. And that doesn't mean that you die and you no longer exist, but you continuously pay for that sin over and over and over again through all eternity without a break. So punishment must be administered because the perfect gift, what is the perfect gift? The perfect gift is Jesus Christ, is the offering of salvation. So punishment must be administered because the perfect gift to purchase your soul, the individual soul, everybody's soul was rejected. If you rejected the perfect gift, Jesus Christ, that rejection will bring God's punishment. It will bring God's wrath upon your soul and eternal damnation. Then verse 10 says, Romans chapter 5, verse 10, for those who just joined. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we've been reconciled, which means we've been reunited to God. We are no longer alienated. We're no longer isolated. We're no longer his enemies. But now we have peace with God because now we're on his side. Now we're his friends. Now we've been adopted into his family. Now we're on his side so that when the battle comes, we will experience total victory over the enemy of our soul who is satan so we shall be saved by his life whose life by the life of jesus and we're being saved those who have repented and received jesus as their lord and savior we're being saved daily it's a daily thing and we experience victory every day in our lives and this victory is over sin every day that you have victory over sin that should be uh, praise moment. That's when you should praise about because now you see that you're 
are fighting from victory to victory. He said, but he says, we're fighting from victory to victory. But then when you experience it, you're no longer hoping for it because now you've experienced it. And now that you've experienced it, it builds your hope up. It builds your faith up and you can stand a little taller because you know that you have that power of God in you. So now you can walk with your chest out and your head up, knowing that your heavenly father is fighting on your behalf. As children of God, we are often chastened and corrected by him, but he does it in love. And he does it because we've erred or we've sinned, and he doesn't not want to put punishment on us, the punishment, the eternal punishment. So he chastens us. He chastens us so that we will repent of that sin. See, reconciliation had a mandatory need. It had to be satisfied. It was a mandatory thing that had to be satisfied and it could only be satisfied by the pure spotless and without blemish the sinless blood of Jesus Christ see God had to intervene to provide us a way in order to be saved from eternal damnation as a result of sin God had to bring a plan in into action that would save us, a plan into action where he would give us the opportunity to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So God manifested his love through Jesus and he declared and sealed it by his death. So when Jesus died, when he was buried, when he was resurrection, it was finished all over. Now we have the uh, reconciliation, the plan of reconciliation by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is our ultimate down payment. The whole Holy Spirit is our down payment that we've been sealed within our heart. Those who are believers, those who repented, received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we have been sealed in our heart. And that seal, that seal is being manifested daily. And what I mean by that is we're daily we should be showing that we are children of the most high God. We should be showing that we are saved. We should be showing that we are followers of Christ. When we enter into eternity, that's when we will see the finality of the seal, what the seal is all about. We will be able to experience everything that God has for us. We'll be able to see it. We will be able to behold his glory once we enter into uh, heaven, into eternity. So we're being saved from evil, danger, destruction, and decay. When we enter into eternity, we can boldly say, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? And we can shout and, and say hallelujah because we know that these things has been swallowed up, have been defeated by the power and authority of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Hallelujah. We are alive in Christ. We are blood-bought believers in Christ. We are saved from God's present and future wrath. Romans 1, 18, chapter 1, verse 18. Remember, we studied that a few weeks, weeks ago. And the consequences of God's wrath, Romans 1, verse 18 says this. And I'm going to read the Amplified Version in order to help you better understand in case you've forgotten what we studied before. It says, for God does not overlook sin and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And that does, doesn't mean just males. It means mankind, righteousness, unrighteousness of men, of mankind who in their wickedness suppress these wicked people, these unrighteous, ungodly people. They try to suppress, which means they try to conceal. They try to restrain. They try to choke the truth and its accuracy. That's what they try to do. They try to choke the truth and its accuracy. So what is truth? Hallelujah. Truth is God's word. God's word is truth. God does not lie. And God is good. He's holy and he's the creator. They're so adamant about trying to wipe out Jesus, trying to wipe out the Bible, that even China is trying to rewrite God's word. And they're going to bring all kinds of wrath upon them because God says not to change his word, not to change that nothing in his word. What he said, he said, what he said, he meant. And they're in the process of rewriting God's word. 
That's the reason why many Christians are killed and will be killed and imprisoned because they're trying, the people that are killing them, that are imprisoning them, they're trying to suppress. They're trying to cancel out the truth because they don't want to hear God's word because God's word shines light on their sin, on their ungodliness. People are choosing, they're making a conscious choice to live unrighteously, to live sinfully, to worship idols, to live unholy, and to live a lie. They're trying to suppress the truth about God. And God says in his word, they are without excuse. Because God right now, he's revealing right now, and we see it on the TV, we read it on the internet, we read it in the newspaper. He's revealing his anger at their ungodly behavior and communication and the way that they're trying to suppress his truth. So God is unleashing, he's unleashing his wrath, but this is nothing compared to what he's going to do if these people don't turn away from sin and unrighteous living and leave his word alone. So verse 11 says, and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So we are, we can now rejoice. You can rejoice. We can show great joy and delight because God through Jesus Christ has reconciled. He's reunited us back to himself. And now we're friends of God. Hallelujah. Galatians 4, 9 asks the question, and this is for your own self-examination. Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. And Galatians says, now... And this is the Amplified. This is now. However, since you have come to know the true God through personal experience, or rather to be known by God or being found by God, how is it that you are turning back again to the weak and worthless elemental and weak principles of religious religions and philosophies to which you want to be enslaved all over again. So now that God has reconciled us and I put that in there, God, I believe God wanted that in there is because he's saying that he has reconciled us to himself. And once he's reconciled you to him, why would you want to go back out to the religions and the philosophies of man, why would you want to go and be entangled and enslaved by those things? Because see, those things, if you return to sin, it enslaves you, it troubles you, it robs you of your sleep, it robs you of your money, your dignity, your peace, your joy, your freedom. Sin robs you of everything. You can't have any peace in sin. You go and try to do some things that you think is right, but then it falls apart. It's because sin is in the mix. Nothing you do is going to flourish. Even those that we see on TV or hear about that are celebrities that are stars or whatever you want to name them. Yeah, they may have money in the bank, but yet they have no spiritual peace. Hallelujah. Those of us who have been saved by grace through faith, we have peace within ourselves. We may not have a lot of money in the bank. We may not even have any money in the bank. But what is so important is we have eternal life. We have peace with God. We can go to God and we know that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We also know that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So if he owns everything, we will never, ever lack for anything. Hallelujah. Regardless of whether your bank account says zero, a thousand, five dollars, ten thousand or whatever, we know that God owns everything. Then in verse 12, it says, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now this one man that they're talking about that caused sin to enter into the world, that's Adam. And it's what he did when he was in the garden of Eden. So it says through Adam, sin entered the, into the world. And not only did sin enter into the world, but when sin came into the world, it brought death to all. So death spread like a disease. It spread like an epidemic. And Christ is the only cure. He is the only answer to be protected. He is the vaccine. It's, he's not man-made. His protection will never expire. It will never lose value. And if you get one of these vaccines now, 
eventually it expires or on the bottle, it even has an expiration date. But see, Christ does not have an expiration date. His salvation does not have an expiration date. Once you receive him as your Lord and Savior, you're always saved. You're sealed with the, the Holy Spirit of God. Let me correct that. Thank you, Lord. You can walk away from God. You can relinquish your salvation. You can throw your hands up and turn away. That's why he said the love of many will wax cold. It's because they've turned away from the true and living God. And then he said that those who have tasted the, the power and the good things to come to renew their mind back to God, he says it's virtually impossible because they have chosen to walk away from God. They've chosen to pick up sin again. They've chosen to live that life again. So when sin entered in the, into the world through Adam, it brought both spiritual death and physical death upon all bodies without exception. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. It says, just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See, we are, we are all subject to death because of Adam's sin. But those who belong to Christ will be given a new life with him for all eternity. But there is a qualification for this new life. To, in order to have this new life, in order to have your name written in the land's book of life, you must repent of your sins. And no, we don't know every sin that we've committed. But when you repent and ask him to forgive you of your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So when you repent of your sins and you receive Jesus as your Lord and, Lord and Savior, before your spirit leaves your physical body, you know that you will enter into eternity and live with Jesus for all eternity. You know that you will be comfort in eternity. But for those who don't receive him and don't repent of their sins before they leave their earthly body, they will receive and experience eternal damnation. See, some people repent because they got caught. And they're repenting because they're ashamed that they got caught. So that's not true repentance. But true repentance comes from the heart. God is looking at our heart. and He's listening to what our heart said. Because people can say many things. I was in a church one <clears throat> one time. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm still battling this cold. I was in a church one time. And the pastor said, everybody repeat after me. So the words were given to the congregation, to everybody that was there to repent of their sins and to repeat what she said to repeat. And that thing bothered me so bad. And I was still a pretty young Christian. So I contacted her and I said, um, <clears throat> what you said that day was not right. Because those people only said what you told them to say. Now, some of them are going to go out thinking that they're saved, but yet they only said what you told them to say. They didn't really mean it. They were just being obedient to what you said. Now they're going to have a false hope that they saved, but they really haven't repented. They only said what you told them to say. They're going to go back out and live the life that they were living. So needless to say, she got uh, pretty upset with me for saying that. But I believe that I was supposed to do that to let her know that you don't give people false hope. Because if they have in their mind, they're going to keep shacking up. If they have in their mind, they're going to keep fornicating. If they have in their mind, they're going to keep committing adultery. And then they said that just because you said their heart was not in it. Their words were in it, but their heart wasn't. So verse 13 says, For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So verse uh, 13 says, for unto the law, sin was in the world. So until the law of Moses was given, sin was not imputed or it was not charged to an individual's account. Although sin was present in the world, and it's obvious that sin was present in the world, because what did we just say a few verses back? That when sin entered into the world, it brought death. So those people in those times, they died as a result of sin. 
but it could not be charged to their account before the law was given because they did not know what sin was. And even Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul says, I didn't even know what sin was until the law identified it. In other words, the law came and the law magnified it, pointed out or taught us what sin is. So before the law was given, the God didn't keep count. He didn't write down their sin because they didn't know that they were sin sinning. So because there was no law to obey or disobey before the law of Moses was given to govern our actions, sin was not charged to the people's account. Verse 14, and I believe that's when Jesus went into the heart of the earth, I believe he preached to those people and they had the opportunity to receive him as Lord and Savior. I believe that with my, all my heart that they had the opportunity to receive him and those who received him as Lord and Savior, they were resurrected to new life. Those are the ones that we saw that they, the Bible talks about came up out of the ground, came up out of the, the tombs, came out of the tombs. They came out to new life, but those who rejected him went into eternal damnation. So nevertheless, nevertheless, verse 14 says, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. See, Adam knew better. He, God specifically told him with his own words, his own voice, there was nobody to distract Adam. God gave him specific instructions what not to do and what he could do. So he had a commandment, but he broke that commandment. He broke what God had told him not to do. So before Moses, the people were still subject to death because of Adam's transgression, because of sin entering into the world through Adam's transgression, it brought death. So all experienced death as a consequence of sin, which shows that sin affected the whole human race. Sin affects the whole human race. But although this physical body will die, those who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we will get a glorified body. We will get a new body that never gets sick. Glory to God. That never hurts. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We will get a brand new body just like Jesus. When he came back to, when he came to earth, he had the glorified body that we all will experience. Those who are saved, those who are saved and received him as their Lord and Savior. Verse 15, Romans 5 verse 15 says, but the free gift, is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So through Adam, through Adam in the garden was born, sin was born into the world. So when we are born, we are born in sin and we're shaped in iniquity. And we have an automatic death sentence that's placed on us as humans because of Adam's disobedience, because his transgression, because he disobeyed God's direct order. And his disobedience, Adam's disobedience, brings that death sentence upon all of us. We didn't get asked, do we want the death sentence? We didn't approve of the death sentence, but because we were born into this human race, it's an automatic, mandatory death sentence. But look, this is the great thing. The free gift that comes through Jesus Christ, it must be accepted. It's not automatic. See, death is automatic. It was automatic. That death sentence was automatic. We weren't even asked. We weren't even given the opportunity to reject that death sentence. But see, Jesus, hallelujah, he is the free gift. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He is a free gift. And you and I, we have to accept the free gift. And I'm glad that I've accepted the free gift. 
It was not automatic. I had to make a conscious decision to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, to repent of my sin, and to trust and believe that when I repented of my sin, that he was faithful and just at that moment to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. No, I don't get everything right. No, I don't always act the way that I should act. But thanks be to God who gives me the victory. He allows me to come and repent. And Jesus is my advocate. He's standing. He's my intercessor. He's standing in between me and God to prevent God's wrath from falling on me when I don't do what's right. When I sin, he's standing there and he says, Father, I'm still working on her. I'm still working things out. So bear with me. I'm still working on her. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So as a result of God's gracious gift, that is very different from the result of one man, Adam's sin, because Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift through Jesus Christ leads us to righteousness and makes us righteous in the sight of God. It even Jesus' life and his blood even justifies us and it cleanses us from the guilt of many sins. Hallelujah. So when the enemy, when you hear him, something coming back to your mind that you know you've repented of, that's the enemy reminding you of those things. Unless you commit that same sin over and over again, then God is allowing you, is, is reminding you that you need to repent. You need to come out of that thing. You need to stop sinning and sinning and sinning. Hallelujah. But when you know you've asked for forgiveness, and you hear about that sin, that's the enemy bringing it back to you because he is an accuser of the brethren. He's constantly going before God and saying, I bet you I can make him or her do this. I bet you I can make them do that. See, they're not all that saved. Look, I was able to trick them and make them fall into that sin. So he's constantly accusing us before God. So we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us and lead God and direct our footsteps so that we won't fall into that sin. Don't be a habitual sinner, which means you commit the same sin over and over. You could constantly fornicate, 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 or commit adultery, adultery, adultery over and over again, or you lie over and over and over again. Don't keep doing those things. Ask God to help you, help you to deliver you in the name of Jesus. So the gift of God through Jesus Christ is the free gift of salvation. It is the gift of eternal life. When we receive his salvation, we get the eternal life. We are made righteous and justified. And we're no longer in the land of the dead, but we cross from death to life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So Jesus, because of his work, this free gift, that came from God through Christ Jesus to bring justification and righteousness to erase. It erases, it eradicates, which means it destroys completely. It puts it into, it removes the condemnation and guilt of sin through Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says now, right this very moment that you hear his word, now there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk, hallelujah, hallelujah God, who walk after his spirit but not after the flesh. Hallelujah. So it's a free gift. You got to accept the free gift. Jesus is our free gift. He is our free gift. So God has given you this free gift. What have you done to it? Why would you want to sever that special relationship? If you know, if you have a friend and you and that friend has a falling out and you find out what it was that caused your falling out and you reconcile back to that friend, you don't want to do that thing again because you don't want to sever the relationship. You don't want to do that same thing again. So with God, now that we know that sin is the reason why we were separated from God, why would you want to commit sin again to sever the relationship uh, that you and God have? Because now you've been reconciled back to him. This is a special relationship. Why would you want to jeopardize your freedom, your peace, your joy, and return to that previous life that you once had? Once had? The life you had before you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. See, the free gift it counsels out the consequences of sin and it grants to you eternal life. So if you walked away from God 
you need to repent and ask him to bring you back to closer to him, to help you so that you won't do that thing again to sever the relationship that you have with had with him. Verse 17 says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So when you look at this particular verse, you see that death is being viewed as having the power like a king or, or a president. And it has this authority over its subjects. And in this particular verse, it's looking at us, the humans, as the subject. And it's saying that death has the, had their power and authority over us as humans. It had jurisdictional power, which means it pronounced a sentence upon us. So death reigned, it prevailed, it controlled or it governed over those under its rule or authority because it came through Adam's transgression. Remember when sin entered into the world, death also came. So it was like a a, 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 a two thing deal. It was like a, a two for one, so to speak. So this death came into the world because of sin, because of Adam's transgression, his disobedience, his offense, and it reigned over the human race. It's subject and it destroys those who reject Jesus' gift of salvation. Those who reject Jesus' gift of salvation, they will experience the death of this death king, so to speak. So Jesus brings abundance of grace. He brings the gift of righteousness. He brings, he reigns over those who have received him as Lord and Savior. That means he should be in control. He should be governing our life. So why is the gift of righteousness? Why is it a gift? Why is righteousness considered a gift? I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but why is righteousness considered a gift? And it's considered a gift because our efforts and our works to become righteous are stained with sin. And our righteousness is as filthy. It's just like a filthy rag. You've seen a white rag that maybe somebody has wiped their hands on and they have all this grease. Maybe they were working on the car or something and they wiped their hands on this, this white towel. And now the towel is stained with, with this grease, this, this stain. And that's how it is with our righteousness. It's stained. No matter how you try to work it out, work that stain out in your own power, it will never come out. It only comes out by the blood of Jesus that he applies to our hearts, that he applies to our sin account. He is the, he was the perfect, the perfect sacrificial lamb. And his work was accepted by God because he was sinless. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. There's nothing we can do to earn righteousness. There's nothing we can do, do to earn God's grace. His grace is unmerited. He gives us grace because he's love, because he is God, and he gives who he chooses to give it to. So there's nothing we can do to earn it. Then in verse 18, it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So here it's telling us that through Adam's offense or his disobedience resulted in judgment. And this judgment brings condemnation, which means it brings conviction. Through Christ's death and resurrection, he brought justification of life, which produces eternal life which is offered to all people. Eternal life is offered to everyone without exception, but it's up to each individual person whether they want to receive this eternal life, this free gift. That's just like if I give you a gift and it's all wrapped up and you never open it, you never experience it, you have no idea what that, what's inside of that box, what's inside of there that I have labeled as a gift. You have never experienced it. You don't know how to, how you, how it would benefit your life. And that's how it is with salvation. Jesus offers it to us, but we've got to accept it. And then we've got to open it and unwrap it to see what all in salvation it entails. It gives us the right to God's throne. It gives us the right to speak life and not death. It gives us the right to sp uh, speak healing over our body. It gives us the right to be able to go and lay hands on people and speak healing to them. 
has so much to salvation. We've got, you've got to experience it for yourself. Then in verse 19, it says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Every time it talks about one man's disobedience, it's talking about Adam in the garden of Eden, how he was disobedient. So also by one man's obedience, talking about Jesus, many will be made righteous. So Adam's disobedience resulted in a verdict of sin and death. So the verdict that was that was pronounced upon the human race because of Adam's disobedience, it was death. So one man, talk about Jesus' obedience, his compliance and his submission to God's authority. Many people who believe and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be made righteous. That means they're going to be justified in God's eyes. So we're becoming more righteous as we follow God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Those of us who are saved, those of us who have received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are justified in God's eyes. So God has declared, he has proclaimed, he has pronounced, he has asserted that we are righteous and he's declared us to be righteous. And then he said, he calls those things that are not into existence as though they already were. So what he does is because we're not righteous, but he calls us righteous. Because we're not just, he justifies us through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Even with our healing, even though you may not feel healed right now, God says you are healed because of the stripes of Jesus. So you've got to just continue to believe and trust and wait for the manifestation in the natural of the healing that's already in the spiritual realm. We can trade our sin for forgiveness and for mercy and grace. We can trade our unrighteousness for Jesus' righteousness. We can trade our rebellion for obedience through faith in Christ Jesus. Then in verse 20, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. For you who just joined, we're Romans chapter 5, verse 20. We're winding down. So moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So the offense might abound. That means that, see, the law magnified. It detailed sin. It pointed out sin. It identified what sin is. So what we inherited from Adam's disobedience was a sin nature. This sin was clearly defined in the word of God. God clearly defines sin so that there is no room for doubt. There's no room for confusion. So everybody knows what sin is. When the law was given, God made sure everybody knows. Everybody knows what his word said. Everybody can read his word. And those who can't read his word can listen to his word being read on TV. Or God will make a way to make sure that that individual will hear his unadulterated, unwarded down word. Because so many preachers and pastors and teachers and evangelists and et cetera, et cetera, are watering down God's word. And God is not happy with his word being watered down because his word is fine just the way it is without human intervention. So he wants us to declare his word exactly as he has written it, exactly as he has moved upon men to write his word. He wants us to minister his to his word exactly like that. That's why I actually to always pull out your Bible and go along, read along with me. And I go line by line, precept on precept. I go verse by verse and I break it down so that anyone on here, regardless of whether you're educated or not, regardless of whether you're in elementary school or whether you uh, have a, a college degree, I break it down so that by the power of the living God, it's not me, but it's the greater one in me so that everybody can understand. Because I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what good is it that the people know your word, but they don't understand your word? And what good is it if they understand, but they don't know how to apply it? So that's how he uses me. He uses me to give you the knowledge, to get, to help you understand what he says so that you will be able to apply it to your life. And oftentimes he'll give me illustration and the Bible, um, Jesus often, often gave uh, the Proverbs or so that people could understand what he was saying based on uh, what they were based on their 
um, job or what, whatever they could understand in that particular area. So God, oftentimes he'll give me uh, something to give you guys so that you can understand what that particular verse is or how to apply that verse. So moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So grace abounded much more. Sin can never exceed God's grace. The grace that he provides, sin can never exceed, exceed that. God's grace is greater than sin, and it leads to eternal life through Christ. Then in verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God's wonderful abounding grace, it far exceeds sin, which brings physical and spiritual death. God's grace brings life to your spirit, and it also will bring you a new transformed body in eternity. So in conclusion, daily problems help us to grow in faith and hope and trust in God. And we can enjoy that peace that comes from being made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ, which makes us righteous in the sight of God. You and I, those of us who have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have the status of royalty. We are kings and queens, but we have the duties of, of a slave, which means that we are working, but we're not working to earn anything, but we're working because we're showing others that we have faith. Faith without works is dead. So since we have faith in Christ, we've got to show others that we have this faith. Faith without works is dead. So we've got to put actions to our words. You say you believe, put actions to it. So be encouraged. Because what you're going through or what you've gone through or what you may go through is just testing your faith. It's testing your trust. It's testing your belief in God. And God knows my faith has been trusted the past few months. Jesus, help me, Lord. So it will cause you to examine where you are in Christ. And it has done that to me. It's caused me to examine where I am in Christ. Why, God, have you not moved in this situation? So I've been asking the Lord, why have you not moved in this situation? Why are you not moving faster? It's a testing of my faith. Hallelujah. Glory, Jesus. Mm -mm -mm. Whew. Thank you, God. So it will cause you to examine where you are in Christ. And if you truly believe what the word of God says about your salvation, about your hope and redemption and your eternal home. Remember, God offers salvation to us because of his grace and not our works. You can't work for it. Good deeds or your good merits cannot earn you salvation. Because if salvation was based on our works, we would not be able to obtain it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So if there are any questions or comments, you can press star six. This is the most critical part of the Bible study of you hearing the word of God and being able to apply it to your life. This is the part where I introduce you to our Lord and Savior. So for anyone who would like to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, this is what I would like for you to pray. This is prayer for your salvation, to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Repeat these words. Lord, I am a sinner and I need a savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose on the third day and ascended back to heaven. I know I am unable to live this life apart from you and I need the indwelling of your Holy Spirit to teach me to guide me into all truth. Help me to live holy, upright, and be faithful to you. I invite you to be Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for saving me and writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. If you've prayed that prayer, 
then your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I encourage you to tune in each Tuesday to our Bible study so that you can grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and the one who you now serve. And I welcome you into the family of God.